Okay, this is the last panel, uh, and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, uh, and uh, boy, I, I had a lot, I really enjoyed these panels, so I look forward to this one as well. So let me just take a minute to to warm this up. Um, uh, normally, Chad Evans would be here, but since he's uh, been ill, I'm going to stand in for him. Uh, this is a panel on the future of partnerships between industry, academia, and national labs, and of course, critical stakeholders. Um, and maybe just to, to set the stage for the conversation, um, there are a number of things that each of these does for the national ecosystem. So the first thing, just to point out that you American universities perform about $80 billion annually in research and development. They provide most of the basic research that goes on, uh, underpins our knowledge and our technology. And of course, they, we, I should say, educate the next generation of students, scientists, engineers, political leaders, and so on. So they are, we are increasingly responsible for uh, laying the foundations for innovation. So secondly, industry, of course, um, converts knowledge and technology into economic value. And so we need to think about how we best can support and couple to that. And thirdly, of course, the national labs are such incredible engines for uh, knowledge generation and application in, at critical scales that universities just don't have. They have teams and they have funding and they are mission oriented to, to accomplish particular goals. And in particular, the 17 national labs of the Department of Energy are just a major competitive asset for the United States. So um, with all of that, um, there's been some action in Congress lately, uh, in particular, to think about how to improve investments in these areas to take things to the next level. And, uh, and it's bipartisan. It's, it's extraordinary to see what's been happening. Uh, for example, Senator Schumer, Senator Young, uh, what was initially the Endless Frontier Act, U.S. Innovates and Competes Act, also in, uh, in the House side of a different version of this. But potentially, literally $100 billion level efforts that could make a big, big difference to the federal ecosystem that supports all of this. So secondly, the commission itself, that we're all here in a commission meeting, are really thinking through how to best optimize all this. So I just wanted to lay all of that out there. The potential is incredible if you think about what can happen in the coming few years, and we need to be ready for that. So just as a, that's just an opening. So um, I, I'm really pleased that we have two um, people with a lot of expertise and experience in this, uh, Dr. Parag Chitnis, who's just joined us as the Vice President for Research and Economic Development here at the University of Wyoming, also having a lot of experience in the federal um, uh, agencies, and Dr. Marianne Walk, the Deputy Laboratory Director for Science and Technology and the Chief Research Officer at Idaho National Laboratory. So I don't have any more cheat sheet here. I think it's up to you now to take it from here. <laughs> okay, I will. I will get this kicked off a little bit. I'm as a national lab person, I'd like to talk a little bit about partnerships and innovation with respect to energy. We've heard a lot about energy during the last couple of days, all the issues involved with transforming our energy system and our expectations for clean, reliable and abundant energy here in the United States. And of course, the clean energy imperative for the entire globe. So obviously this is a really big problem and uh, we need a lot of partnerships to attack that problem. And we have to break it into different parts and then put it back together into a system. So it requires a lot of systems engineering thinking as well. Well, the US Department of Energy has decided to uh, create a bunch of these different earth shots. So you've been hearing about moon shots. Well, DOE has earth shots and they have some definitions which I wrote down. So I'm going to read them to you that these uh, Earth shots are going to address single technology barriers, offer a bold ch challenge for US innovation, involve stakeholder communities, have defined goals, and they're addressable within a decade. So far, there are three that have been defined and more in, are in definition. In fact, there's a big workshop about this next week. So the three that have been defined so far are hydrogen, energy storage, and carbon negative. So these are all opportunities for us to innovate through partnerships. And I would like to just talk a little bit about some of the things that we, how, how do we do that? What are the types of partnerships across government, across academia and industry, and with the communities that we need to 
to have in order to make these earth shots work and, and contribute to our energy future. So I thought I'd, tr I'd try to frame this around critical minerals. We've been talking quite a bit about rare earth minerals, critical mineral structures, how, how important that is for the state of Wyoming as well as for the nation. And so of course you, you all know about these hard to pronounce minerals and materials, things like lithium, that's not so bad, yttrium, neodymium, different elements that are found in the earth's crust in uh, low concentration ores. And so that makes them hard to mine, then maybe not so hard to mine, but hard to, you have to mine a lot of volume, right? And it's been cheaper to do that in China and they have less regulation. And so we buy our critical minerals from China and the ones that we mine here, we, we ship to China to process. So that creates, of course, a national security problem as well as a, an energy problem for us. And so I would expect that at some point, and I know DOE is, is planning on quite a bit of investment in the critical minerals area as well. So how are we going to do this with partnerships? So we need to have partnerships across the government to do this, right? We, we, have, we have the Department of Energy and the executive branch. But we also need Congress to provide us with funding. And they have to provide us with the right type of funding. So recently in the bilateral, um, bipartisan, excuse me, infrastructure bill, we were provided with a lot of funding for demonstrations. We also need funding for R&D as well. When you get to the executive branch of the government, if you think about critical minerals, this is not just the Department of Energy. We are also have to think about the Department of Interior. We have to think about the Environmental Protection Agency. I'm and I'm sure there are several other agencies I've missed because there's a lot of agencies. So we have to have interagency cooperation throughout the government as well. Then when we get into DOE itself, we, we will have this new Office of Clean Energy, Energy Demonstrations, OCED, which is being formed as a result of this bill and these funds to do demonstrations. But we will be doing the R&D work within the existing Applied Energy offices and the Office of Science within the Department of Energy. So we will need partnerships within DOE across these different offices, which for those of you who have worked with the Department of Energy, you might know that's not always as easy as it might, you might think. In order to couple our research and development results with the demonstrations. And then you've got the national labs, which Dr. Seidel mentioned. We have over 60,000 employees across 17 national laboratories in the, in the United States with a great variety of different types of capabilities which can be brought to bear. But these national laboratories are not always collaborative. Sometimes they compete against each other. So we need partnerships among the national laboratories and with the Department of Energy. A recent good example or positive example of this was during the pandemic when we created the National Virtual Biotech Lab and I was part of that planning, which was, it was a great, um, great experience to bring the national labs together with funding that was provided by the CARES Act in order to create self-create teams that partnered with academia and industry to create actual products uh, for the uh, COVID pandemic in regards to testing and manufacturing in particular. And it was a great success in terms of multiple laboratory collaborations. So that was some, hopefully something that we can carry over into these new earth shots. Then of course, we need to partner with academia, universities like Wyoming and many others in order to couple the research that's done with the labs with the research done at the, at the universities and then take that through cross TRL levels to work with industry to get it deployed. So more partnerships involved there. And of course, in that regard, we're going to need to have uh, IP protections. And when you think about starting to think about critical minerals, we're going to be thinking about new processing techniques, for example. How are we going to protect the intellectual property there, get those uh, instantiated into the industry? So obviously they're going to be required to uh, do these earth shots. We're going to need to have management structures that are inclusive and across boundaries. And finally, we're going to need to include the communities. If they, again, if you think about critical minerals, we're talking many times about mines, mines that might be new, might be reopened, or perhaps we want to reprocess existing mine tailings. In all of those situations, we need to have community buy-in for those processes in order for them to be effective. And so therefore we need to have partnerships with the communities as well. Now, obviously none of those uh, ideas or partnerships are new, all of them exist in some 
respect these days, but we have to put them all together into the system in order to make some uh, progress with our innovation on some of these big energy challenges. So I'll stop there and turn it over to my colleague. Thank you. And what I'm going to do in order to make it easier for you to understand my Kansas City accent, <laughs> uh, I thought I'd use a presentation. Uh, so uh, first, first of all, I think for the partnership, I, I kind of focus on how these entities like industry, academia, and the national laboratories and others can come together. And to give examples of this, and again, when I talked about national laboratories, I did not just the DOE ones, but there's like NCAR, which is right here, uh, not very far from here. Uh, there are other like agencies have their research facilities. So I kind of included all of that federal research enterprise that how can they work with the uh, academy? I thought, oh, maybe I can give examples of something like, uh, why do they want to actually, first of all, come together, right? They bring different assets to the table. They bring like human resources, researchers like universities. The major part of universities, community colleges is the workforce development. Then um, technology knowledge, as we talked about. National laboratories, I think one of their major, I think is that research infrastructure. It's unique, it's very expensive, it probably none of the universities can really afford it. And I think using that infrastructure is really important for addressing the challenges. And then the industry, I think the main part of industry, they actually will be able to take it to the market and to the consumers of those technologies and those business models. And the last but not the least, we need investments and the incentives. And that's where the venture capital, as well as the government agency, community organizations come in picture because those incentives can be financial, can be regulatory, any type of those incentives are very useful. So that's why these all of these things need to come together. So maybe I can give you examples of what Wyoming is already doing with the NCAR. We have a supercomputing center. It's going to increase its capacity in the next few months. How can you be using that capacity to really channel innovation in this a part of the country. Or we can talk about our collaboration with the Idaho National Lab. And we have several projects, whether it is workforce development or it is research that we are already doing. Or some, some mature example, and we are not involved in Wyoming, but this is when, when I was at NSF, I got involved in, which was about Energy Biosciences Institute at Berkeley, where, Illinois, Berkeley, along with Lawrence Berkeley Lab and Shell, who came together and formed the institute, which led to several companies uh, that started there. Some of them are producing biofuels, jet fuels that go in commercial planes. So that kind of innovation has happened, but what's in the future? So I want to take you back to Wyoming and talk about Fort Washington. It's a small community of 1,800 people, about 90% Native American. Median household income in Washakie is about 49,000, whereas Wyoming or national average is 65,000 and with about 28% poverty rate. And where is this place? It's on the Wind River Reservation. About four hours, kind of plus and minus, this part of the country, you drive probably 100 miles an hour, so it could be less than that. <laughs> uh, uh, is Idaho Falls. Another four hours or so on the other direction is Laramie. So the, the, where the research gets done, education, higher education gets done, it's not as close to this type of community. How do you bring innovation to these communities? And that's what I think many of our place-based discussion was, and how can we all come together to help these communities? So there are a lot of challenges that came in the several discussions. Population density, a strong argument was made. They, there isn't enough population density to support an 
ecosystem that is like an innovation ecosystem in this area. Well, now we could probably turn it around and say, what can innovation be? What kind of innovations are needed to actually support economic development in these countries, in this type of communities? Access to technology, broadband in particular could be a problem. There is cultural diversity. And I was at discussions just last two days, I've been learning so much about Wyoming. Uh, this particular town, there are two towns next to each other. They have completely different cultures in terms of how they approach new ideas and new challenges. Uh, then there are social and communication gaps, right? Adoption of new thinking, new types of businesses, are those possible? And then the most important part is the quality of life, which some people like and some people may not like and may move away. So whether it is entertainment, whether it is uh, education, access to health, those are the kinds of questions that people will ask if they want to move to this area or even innovate or stay in this area. When we talk about innovation, there are like three main components we talk about, right? Minds, whether it is ideas or workforce, money, and then that cultural aspect of innovation and entrepreneurship. But to really go to these areas and accelerate innovation, we also need to procure your metrics around which all of these things can be facilitated a lot more quickly than the current model where it's kind of a random diffusion of ideas. Somebody kind of does research. Somebody wants to pick up that IP and really innovate it and bring it to market. And maybe some big company buys it and then probably eventually it reaches the consumers. How can be done together to actually innovate it? Some of the things that we can do could be this use inspired research for disruptive technology. How can we really work together? Because none of us will have those, all the like expertise that is needed. National labs are really great at physical sciences or even biological sciences. But when it comes to social sciences, maybe universities will be a better kind of partners in bringing them to the table. Uh, then the regional networks for those local economic development. And I think we heard that examples from it uh, in the, the talk that Ed gave in the afternoon at the lunchtime, the different networks that I think he has really implemented. Those are really important. And that's where universities, national labs, community colleges are really important. Governments, whether federal, state, and local will be important. And then the community organizations and the venture capital, all of those things to be come together. And since there isn't that population density, what we need is not just the site of physical incubator, but potentially for digital type of industry, the platforms and marketplaces for innovation, those could be digital, where we can pull together those anchor industries that I think we talked, I think were mentioned in the morning, and then those emerging small businesses that can help those anchor industries can potentially then purchase those uh, innovations, those small business kind of, uh, ideas and then kind of facilitate transfer to the consumers a lot more quickly. And of course, we need the workforce for this. How do we then retool them, retrain them in community colleges, universities are really geared towards it and bringing it all together can help us and it will need all of us to work together so that these networks across the country in rural areas can be supported. So there are not only challenges, but opportunities that include those unique ecosystems, that diversity. So what we want to do should be that culturally compatible. So in that Fort Washaki I talked about, the type of businesses that are needed are what are culturally compatible and in those areas. They should be rooted in those communities 
quality of life and now what kind of innovations do you need to really maintain improve quality of life in those communities and then adoption of innovation those communication and that's where we need social sciences to actually make sure those are adopted in the communities that we are trying to serve so that Wyoming's innovation ecosystem that I think Ed has been kind of really spearheading in implementing with all those yellow dots of community colleges and Idaho National Dam is one star on one side and then the other star on the to lower corner is Laramie, the University of Wyoming and a few stars down there all the, all those institutions of higher learning and labs down south in the state i forgot the name uh, <laughs> and that's all the government organizations that are in those uh, uh, in uh, cheyenne primarily all of them have to work together and there are several models already in place of those networks those can be coordinated in order to reach not only that red dot in the middle, Fort Washiki, but other communities across this rural area from Sheridan, Casper, uh, even Jackson, even though it's rich, still would they need innovation there for managing that tourism. Uh, so these are the, I think this is where I think we need to come together as a network. And that's probably the more changing model from what happened in Berkeley and Illinois with that energy biosciences, where we need to work as a network to bring each other strengths together. And then we can innovate the whole regional ecosystems. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks to you both. So. so we have about 10 minutes, I think, for questions here. And um, I'd, I'd like to, to start and maybe Please be thinking of some questions in the audience, um, and maybe I'll just um, I'll ask Steve Farkas to think of a question. I'm just <laughs> to make sure we, <laughs> yeah, uh, in it, it, I'll be ready. In, in, oh, no, in a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask some questions first. But oh, you you have a you have a comment you want to make? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so it's very interesting talking about partnerships. Um, I think something that we um, haven't touched on, and perhaps the, um, the uh, speakers could touch on or you, or you could touch on is um, the amount of time one invests in developing the partnerships yeah. that then lead to to work so thinking about um, INL and um, these earth shots um, where you're going to try to achieve these in 10 years um, are you going to eat up you know um, nine of the 10 years with the permitting process with the example that you used I don't think I can answer about permitting uh, but with regards to partnership development we are often faced with you know, the conundrum of pre-developing partnerships with universities and with industry in order to uh, take advantage of federal funding that becomes available to do innovative work. So what we have discovered, you know, maybe it should have dawned on us earlier, but you have to pre-form teams in particular subject matter areas, anticipate what is going to be funded federally, work with your university partners ahead of time to say, okay, if we get this opportunity, this is what we would like to propose. And then also, if we're going to be working with industry, putting together agreements with industry is not something that the national laboratories are known to be speedy at. So we are continually working on those processes to help them make, make that, but definitely trying to anticipate what our opportunities will be in terms of technology development and develop the partnerships ahead of time, I think is really key for our, us in the national laboratories. Now, I'll, I'll pass on to Prague, actually, if you wanna make a comment on that too, but I, I really like that question because we talk about partnership as if you could snap your fingers and suddenly it happens. It really requires time and money, both. And uh, you have to be really, really, dedicated, I think, to seeing it succeed. I, I think part of the motivation here generally is we are, our backs are up against the wall in some ways. We've got to find ways to innovate and grow our economies, particularly in these rural regions. So that ought to motivate us, but that it requires a lot. So anyway, Prague, do you want to add something? Well, I think, uh, some of the key parts of those <clears throat> partnerships, identifying mutual interests and strengths, 
and then focus on those areas and then we need to commit resources mm -hmm. uh, for those in order to really those partnerships to not only foster but sustain afterwards yeah that's that's the key to those partnerships. right and the personal relationships are really important so what i mentioned cardiff and that came up a couple of times there there's some reasons why we have deep personal relationships there but also it's got to be in both parties or multiple parties in mutual interest and to, to do so you have to find that mutual value proposition and really really uh, uh work on that so <clears throat> could i uh, maybe direct another question to you guys um it it would be good if there was um, some concrete examples that you have where you think a partnership worked very well or what was good about it that that brought it together or what were some issues that didn't work or are there ideas you have that you think would be really great that you could just propose that that haven't really been explored yet that would help bring partners together so just let you take that so let me like take like my one month ago hat also in this giving some answers so one of the thing in partnerships right where there is this complications of having those arrangements ip arrangements or or just the agreements one thing that works when there are multiple partners involved then if we have an agreement with inl and we have an agreement with an industry maybe then you don't have to have direct agreement with industry and we can still work together uh, in my previous job, when I was at USDA, we did that because USDA had, and now I can say that, a lot of bureaucracy because <laughs> it had so many years. This one is one of the first federal kind of departments and so Lincoln founded it and it had long time to accumulate bureaucracy. But we <laughs> collaborated with NSF and had MOUs with NSF. So we, when we wanted to work with RC UK, we, we just worked through NSF and didn't have to have another MOU with uh, uh, UKRI now their agency. So that's how then we kind of work together without having to really get boggled into those details. And those kinds of things work when you bring industry also to the table. I'll give you another example, completely different. And this one was about citrus screening and my, from my previous job. So we brought in Bayer because they didn't want it to de-risk the investments because they didn't want to spend a lot of money in screening the uh, all different chemicals they already had because the market is only Florida and California for growing citrus. So we put in money, state put in money, Bayer brought all their technology and citrus growers put in money and then they screen all the chemicals and came up with solutions that then the citrus industry could use. So it was university, or well, ARS was part of it. So research like stations from federal research, as well as companies coming together to solve a critical problem. So those are the kinds of models can help us actually solving those problems which are difficult and complex when it comes to innovation in rural america yeah so find mutual value proposition and then everyone has to bring something to the table to, in order to, to demonstrate so marianne well again in, in department of energy land many of our big programs are built into partnerships are built into them so one example at idaho is that we are working with several different reactor development companies on reactor demonstrations and those are i think often can be very successful are being uh, implemented and require a lot of again um, partnership uh, mutual interest to, to advance but they are essential for for the laboratory we are providing the space for the reactor developers to demonstrate their product. And hopefully this is going to bring them much closer to, to uh, reality in terms of an actual market. So that's, I think we can provide a lot of value. So the Department of Energy really um, does structure a lot of their programs around partnerships, either partnerships with universities in the labs, partnerships with industry in the labs or the entire spectrum. An example at the other end of the spectrum 
is uh, Energy Frontier Research Centers, which are funded out of the DOE Office of Science. And these are relatively small. They're usually $4 million a year projects. They run for four years. They require partnerships. They are typically multiple national laboratories and multiple universities that are focusing on, on use inspired research on particular topics. There's several that have been around nuclear fuels. There have been so many around carbon sequestration, for example, in the, in the past as well. And those are, have been very successful in order to change the game with regards to uh, maturation of research that can then be used to develop technologies. I think when we have problems is when we are, it's sort of a shotgun marriage type of approach. And all of a sudden we've got some sort of opportunity and we, oh, we should partner with somebody to put in a proposal here, but we don't have the pre-existing relationships. We haven't done our homework to understand the mutual benefits, the mutual value propositions. That's when you might have more uh, challenges in terms of success. Good. So we probably have time for about one more question. Um, I, I have one stored up here. I have, I have a whole bunch, but um, anybody from the audience have something they want to bring up? Looking at Steve, but um, yeah. all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Well, Steve, oh, he's got one. Good. <laughs> put, put me on the spot like that. I feel the pressure. So some would say that uh, rule-based innovation um, uh, can happen much more quickly because we can be more nimble and a lot of activities can be employed around innovation versus some of the larger markets. So how do we do a better job of taking rule-based innovation and plugging it into what the, what the nation needs to maintain that level of competitiveness that we're talking about during this conference? Go ahead, Brian. So, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if rural-based innovation is easier. In fact, I would say it's difficult because you need to have a network rather than just one urban community. And I think the example of what we heard from Arizona State University with their seven uh, different like innovation parts, what we want to do is then compare that with say the, the statewide innovation kind of uh, parts that we have in say uh, Wyoming, what worked, what didn't work, which model can be then amplified to say other urban areas or other rural state. So I think that scaling up part, because these are all experiments happening across the country. What worked, what didn't work, I think we need to compare the results. And while we are still conducting the experiments so we can adjust them, and then replicate them in other areas. I just add the, uh, perhaps a, an advantage with starting with rural areas is that you can start small. You don't have to have a huge infrastructure to begin with so you can pilot things. Um, my, my lab is essentially, it's not rural exactly in Idaho Falls, but we have many rural areas around us that provides us with the opportunities to work some of these small projects. We're doing quite a bit in the K through 12 STEM area right now in terms of trying out new ways of um, making a difference. And so I think that that's the advantage would be the scale. I'll just uh, maybe conclude. I know we have to shut down here, but uh, just to comment on, on that, um, I, I'm convinced that in rural areas, because the population base is small and because um, it, the density is low. We have both both those issues. We've got to find the partnerships to, in order to achieve some sense of critical mass, uh, or else you just don't have the diversity of ideas and the support networks and so on. So I think for us, that's absolutely essential. All right. Well, thanks to you both for a great uh, panel. Um, thanks, everybody, for some questions.